warm welcome to you as well. Now we're going to get started real soon, so do grab a seat and we'll start with a time of worship, so I'll pass it to Brother Uncle K. Good morning, folks. Shall we all stand? It's a beautiful morning. Are you awake? Are you guys awake? Just to make sure you're awake. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Shake your all up. Shake your all up. Shake your all up. Right, guys, I'm going to do some old songs today, okay? The first one is called Rescuer. Now, I want you to do something special about this thing, okay? <laughs> so the chorus, it goes like this. <laughs> He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. Well, praise the Lord, our rescuer. Right, what I want you to do is when we sing, He's our rescuer. Hey! Raise your hand. Hey! Again. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. About we'll praise the Lord, our rescue. Amen. It's good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed for the good Lord. Has come to see and save. Are you ready? He's our rescuer. Hey! He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Hey! Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is beauty. Friendship for the one, the warring north. He's pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. For the good Lord is the way to cheer the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way to cheer the life. Everybody! He's
promises on your truth and on your word we worship you jesus today be with us today in jesus name amen please be seated amen would you turn to the person around you and say it's good to see you here this morning Thanks. 
Make sure it's everyone around you, behind you, beside you, above you. Above? <laughs> All right. Welcome again to BCC. For those of you who are here for the very first time, we'd like to welcome you. And for those of you who are joining us online, uh, a very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, as always, before we start, we would like to show you a trailer of what our young explorers will be exploring in their classes today. So here is a sneak peek into what they'll be learning about this morning. Can we have the video, please? Stop. Clap offering. Man. All right, explorers, you're free to go to your uh, classes now. If you're here for the very first time, we've got three different classes that seek to minister to your children from as young as three years old to 11 years old. Um, if you see on the next slide, uh, we have got little and pre-reception, th so that's three to five years old. Today, you're with Edwina. If you're five to eight years old, you're in Junior Explorers. Today, you're with Mandy. Uh, and if you're in Grand Explorers, that's eight to 11 years old, you're with Hoi Fai and Abby. Uh, parents and guardians, remember to sign them, sign them in and sign them out after the service. All right. Shall we pray as the, as the kids go to their classes? Lord Jesus, we, we pray for your presence to be so real in each of the classes today. Stir their hearts for more of you and let your word be life to each of them. We pray that you anoint the teachers as they share and teach, and Holy Spirit, come and sweep across each class, teacher, and student this day. Cover them and keep them safe in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, we're going to go through some news and notices. Uh, the first one is on baptism. So this is just a reminder that we have baptisms on the 3rd of December. So if you've not been baptized, we'll encourage you to take this step of faith uh, to sign up and get baptized. If you need more information about uh, the baptism, do reach out to Bert. If you scan the QR code, that should take you to a form where you can fill up and uh, Bert can then uh, follow up with you. All right, next week we have a very special uh, Oikos service. And to tell you a bit more about next week, I would like to invite Pastor Bert to come up and uh, say a few words. Uh, thanks, Josh. So uh, normally on the fifth Sunday of uh, the month, we try to have a special service. Uh, and this week, this coming next week, we're going to try something uh, even more exciting that we haven't really done in a while. Uh, so uh, when we say an oil call service, it's kind of like all age, uh, everyone together. But one of the big challenges I know we've been having is we don't have that much time to talk to each other. And I kick everybody out really aggressively at 11 o'clock. Um, so what we're going to be trying doing next week, and I think this will be fun if everyone kind of gets involved, is we're going to have four kind of zones here in church. So we'll come together, we'll start, we'll have some worship, and then downstairs, uh, I'm going to invite anyone here to bring cake or something or purchase a cake or cakes or muffins or things like that, and we can share them. We'll have them to share together, and you guys can sit and talk a little bit more. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a zone where you can ask some questions about anything, church or God or any questions you've ever had, so that'll be happening downstairs. Upstairs, we're going to have uh, shoebox packing, so uh, not with shoes, uh, but with uh, we'll have a little bit of information about that just after that. Uh, I'll show you a little video about what the shoebox packing is about, but it's with this uh, group called Samaritan's Purse, and they send these gifts uh, all around the world, uh, especially to places that are uh, war-torn and have a chance to do that, so we'll be doing that. And uh, if you can, if you don't want to bring cakes and stuff like that, you can bring stuff to fill the shoeboxes with, and I'll show you a little video, video about that afterwards. If you're like, oh, I don't want to interact with people, and I don't want to pack shoe boxes because I don't like boxes, uh, we're going to have a section to write cards for our missionaries. Uh, have a chance to sign and uh, write cards. Uh, I'll see if I can get any uh, missionaries to record a little bit something about themselves so we can at least see a little bit more about them, but that'll be kind of fun to be having. And we'll be doing those in the classrooms in the back. And finally, we're hoping to have also a little prayer zone probably here in the front area uh, where you have a chance if... If anything's going on in your life or you want to pray about something in particular, we'll have a section there just for us to be able to pray for. So I think that, well, I don't think, but that's what we're going to try next week. Uh, 
And it'll be really nice if you guys are here, you have a chance to talk to each other, uh, get to know each other a little bit more, uh, have a chance to also hopefully eat some cakes and uh, make some cards. So if you are interested in helping out, you don't have to fill out a QR code or anything. Just bring cakes. <laughs> if it seems like I really want to eat cakes, I don't have to be cakes. They could be bows. They could be Chinese bows. They could be cookies. Anything that we can eat that's edible. That's normally what edible and eat mean. Um, let me show you a video on, oh, this is, we've jumped ahead. Uh, the video of, the thing is gone. Uh, the, uh, sorry, I'm gonna see if Alex is gonna find it. He's gonna quit this and then see if you can re-add those, uh, the slides for uh, what the shoebox is about, the shoebox packing. It might just be hidden. Oh, I'm gonna make it reappear like this. No, I failed. <laughs> I try one more time and see if my timing with Alex can be so good. Ready? What? Is it there? I can't read his eyeballs. <laughs> I see Matt is giving me a high five, though. Five, four. While we're doing this, turn around and say hi to the person next to you. And um, <laughs> say, ah, oh, hi. Oh, you got the best seat <laughs> right in the front. But today is not me preaching, so you're lucky. Uh, okay, so you can watch this video, and this will tell you a little bit about uh, what Operation Christmas Child is about. So, play. I failed in that playing of that video, which didn't work. Go backwards. Does that does that video not autoplay? Uh, let me describe the video. Three, two, one. When that shoebox is opened, they are overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. How much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about his son, Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? Every year we see tens of thousands of children disciple, and we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. We actually met uh, last year. We were packing the shoe boxes, and there was a girl from the Ukraine uh, who was here, but actually years ago she had... Uh, been part of it and received a shoebox as a child, and then now she was back helping. It was really awesome to meet me here, and uh, also just see uh, how uh, all of this has helped us be all more aware of both refugees and things going around the world. So the things that go into shoeboxes uh, are things like toiletries. They all have to be new, pens, uh, little shoe, uh, papers. You can bring out like a soft toy, but all have to be new. So don't look for things in your house that you don't want, uh, like we normally do as Chinese people, and give and say, oh, it's still useful. Uh, if it's not useful to you, it's not going to be useful to someone else. So, um, but uh, what we'll do is I'll send some more information about all of this in uh, our WhatsApp group, uh, and then you can know, and hopefully you can bring some of those too as well. We'll have shoe boxes here, um, so don't worry about that. But if you do have a spare shoe box, you can bring that as well, um, and we'll try and see how many we can pack. And then if you're curious, if you're like, oh, what do you do with these shoe boxes afterwards? We actually just, you can take them down to the bull ring, into the entertainer, where they uh, actually is a receiving center to take it into where it gets distribu distributed later. They don't worry, they don't open it up and resell it in the entertainer. Um, so that's gonna be happening. And so once again, if you're curious, next week we're gonna have four zones to so come here same time. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, our morning service starts at 9.30. Okay, just, just putting that out there if you think it starts at 9.45. It doesn't. Okay, great. Uh, with that, I'm going to give the time back to Josh. All right. Thanks, Bert. I will hope to see all of you there next week. And um, that's what's happening next week in the morning. But in the evening, we've got an encounter night. So that's just an extended time of prayer. If we have the next slide, that's uh, encounter night. Praise and worship. Yeah, so it's an extended time of praise and worship. So do think of um, a friend to invite uh, next week uh, to the morning and evening services. All right. Next up, we're gonna have a we're gonna come to the time of giving. So a giving is just a time for us to give back uh, to God through our uh, finances to as a form of worship. So 
as I invite the stu- before I invite the stewards to come up, let's, uh, let's pray for the offering. Father God, we just want to thank you that, and we want to acknowledge, oh God, that Lord, it is you who first gave your one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And so it is in our new nature to give. And Lord, as we give this day, we pray that you will remind us that we are just stewards on this earth. And so help us, oh God, to see past the financials and see towards your kingdom. And Lord, as we give this day, we pray that you will bless the leaders of BCEC to use these funds wisely for the furtherance and expansion of your kingdom. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Can I please invite the stewards to come forward uh, to collect the offering? Uh, there are many ways to give. You can give through the uh, offering bag or you can scan the QR code as well. And sh- that should take you to our website where it will have details on our bank accounts and uh, the various other forms uh, that you can give as well. And if you're a UK taxpayer, do remember to sign up for Give Aid uh, so that we can claim a portion of that back as well. Right, so we've been doing this for uh, a few weeks now where we'll pray together as a church in the morning. Um, and this, we've been praying for Israel and Palestine for the past two weeks now. So, uh, and we would still like to encourage you to continue praying for Israel and Palestine in your respective life groups and in your daily prayers. But today, I was thinking uh, that we could pray for all the world, all the wars in the world. Uh, uh, so, would you just close your eyes and bow your heads as as we pray? Father God, we just want to thank you that we can gather in your name to pray today. And we want to lift up not only the situation in Israel and Palestine and Ukraine, but all the wars that plague our earth. We know, God, that your love is the greatest force in this universe. And we pray that your love prevails over hatred, it prevails over violence, and it prevails over division not only in Israel and Palestine and Ukraine, but in every corner of this earth. And we pray, Lord, specifically for the leaders of nations. Lord, remind them that they are there for a reason. So, Father God, touch their hearts with your wisdom and your compassion and a desire for peace. And may they be inspired to seek understanding and justice above all else. And Father God, we just want to pray for all those who suffer the most in times of war. The innocent, the displaced, the kidnapped, and the vulnerable. Father God, we pray that may your protection and comfort surround them, and may they find refuge in your love. And Father God, in these darkest times, we pray that many will turn to you for answers. And for those believers, may this adversity strengthen their faith and deepen their trust in you. So Lord, we understand that true peace begins in the hearts of individuals. So help us, oh God, to be peacemakers, promoting love and forgiveness in our own lives and in our own communities. So we place our faith in you and may your love and your peace reign in the hearts of those suffering in this conflict. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I would like to pass the time now to Pastor Josh as he shares today's message. Thank you, MC Josh, for passing the time. Goodness me. He's such a good MC. It makes me feel both confident and yet intimidated that I need to follow. Oh, that's awesome. And what a team of Joshes we have as well. Okay. So I can see over there. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? It's so good to see all of you. We are carrying on, <coughs> excuse me, on our series of what it means to be a spiritual family. In this last quarter of uh, this calendar year, we're, we're kind of looking, we're going through this we're, we're, we're escalating the idea of what it means to be spiritual. In the previous mini-series, we looked at this idea of what does it mean to have us, our, our own personal spiritual lives? What does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit inside of us? And in the last four weeks, including this one, we've been expanding that, trying to ask the question of what does it mean to be a spiritual family? 
as the Spirit starts to live inside of me individually, how is that same Spirit uniting all of us in this room or in the universal church to be one large spiritual family? And today, we're going to be closing off this mini-series and this wider series of this new heart theme by looking at this idea of... I should press it like five seconds before I'm going to do it. Okay, right. We're going to be looking at this, this idea of acceptance. Um, and it's an interesting idea. Like we, can, we can think about what it means to be a Christian, and like usually it's these ideas of love and, accept, uh, sorry, love and faithfulness and all these wonderful good things. And when we get to this idea of acceptance, it, it, it shifts its tone slightly. What does it mean to be accepted? What does it mean to be welcomed? What does it mean to be loved? As an individual, as a family, what does it not so much mean for us to accept others, but I think one question we can be asking ourselves this morning is, what does it look like for me to be accepted into um, the spiritual family? Because if we can't do that, if we don't realize that we're accepted in the first place, where are we going to find the strength to then accept others. And the book that we're going to be going through today, you'll notice that over the last four weeks, we've been taking these um, smallish, shortish books in the Old Testament and trying to uh, extract something thematically uh, from each one of them. Today, we're going, through, we're going to be going through the book of Ruth. I will not be reading uh, the entire book of Ruth. We'll be here for about an hour, which makes my, my life quite easy, but we'll also get kicked out before that happens as well. Um, but I'll be taking these three panels uh, from this book of Ruth. If you're familiar with the story of Ruth, let me just give you a quick contextual summary of all of it. Ruth is this lady uh, who, along with another lady, ends up marrying, uh, the, well, no, as in the two girls, they married two different guys. <laughs> the two husbands then unfortunately die. Ruth then ends up staying with her mother-in-law and goes back with her to uh, her home country. Um, and then from that experience, she ends up marrying this other guy called Boaz, who is a kinsman to her original uh, husband. And what we see from the story of Ruth, if you've read it before, it is this wonderful picture of what does it mean to show faithfulness? What does it mean to show love uh, to someone? Even when they don't, even when you or Ruth or Boaz or Naomi don't necessarily need to be doing those things. And it, it tries to point forward to the love and acceptance that God offers to his people as well. That's the quick summary. And what I'm going to do is, uh, rather than going through each one in three different phases, I'm just going to read these three panels out uh, from this book of Ruth to give us an idea into the mind and the heart and the thinking of these three characters and what God is doing through all of that. But what I want to do before I start reading is to give us a bit of a filter as we're reading. To not so much look at necessarily the, the, the heroism or the goodness, when we, when we read Bible passages, we're, we're, we're tending to, we, we tend to approach it, especially as Asians, in a very, very pragmatic way. What do I have to do? What am I trying to copy? What virtues, what ethics do I have to learn to become more like Jesus? And for the most part, that's fine. We want to learn. We want to regulate our faith. We want to understand how it is that I'm meant to be showing love to others. But maybe this time what we can do is take the other side of that perspective. What does it mean to be on the receiving end of that love and kindness? And so as we look at these characters, we can have that perspective in mind. Is that okay? So if you've got a Bible, uh, please turn me to the book of Ruth. Uh, it will also be on the screen as well. I'll be reading from the NIV, and the first section I'll read from is Ruth chapter 1, verses 11 through 18. There. It says this. But Naomi, that's the mother-in-law, said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again as the two daughters. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. 
But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So like I said, we read that, and our focus, our attention turns to the character of Ruth, her actions, her motives, her virtue. Orpah, the other uh, daughter-in-law, she doesn't do a bad thing. Like she's completely free to go back to her, to her land. But, but Ruth, when we look at Ruth, we, we immediately are drawn to her kindness. We're drawn to her, her goodness, her gentleness, and saying, no, Naomi, my mother-in-law, I will stay with you. And it sometimes blinds us from seeing Naomi's character, her perspective in this. This idea that in her old age, in her frailty, in her, in her improbability of being able to provo- provide for her daughter-in-law with new sons, nor be able to provide for herself. She is old, she is frail, she is back in this culture. A woman nece- didn't necessarily have the means to be able to work to earn a living. They had to rely on having a family, having husbands, having sons to provide for them. This is an incredible moment of insecurity for Naomi. Financially, socially, familiarly and relationally, this is a lady in her old age that is kind enough to let go of her two daughters-in-law. And yet, the feeling inside of her, I imagine, would be one of, will anyone look after me in my old age? Who's going to accept me? Who's going to look after me? Jumping forward a couple of chapters, Naomi instructs Ruth to go and talk to Boaz. They have, through chance, through providence, Ruth and Boaz have encountered each other, and Naomi says, you know what, Boaz is someone that could marry you. Back in those days, there was a system where if a husband died, then that husband's brother's uh, were then able to, uh, especially if that if that family had had no children yet, if the brother had not born any, if if that couple had not born any sons yet, there was a provision in their laws to allow a brother to marry that uh, that widow, in order to provide for new sons, in order to maintain the family legacy. We won't go into the details of it. It's very archaic and strange to us, but that was normal back in those times. And so, Naomi instructs Ruth, go and talk to Boaz. And make that proposition. See if he's willing to take upon that offer. And so Ruth goes and visits Boaz in the night. And this is the scene that ensues. Ruth chapter seven verses sorry, chapter three verses seven through thirteen. It says this: When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a garden redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Ruth herself is in a difficult position. She's been widowed. 
she hasn't got she hasn't provided any sons yet she doesn't have a family right she has a mother-in-law but no one else to provide for her how is she going to provide for both herself and her mother-in-law in this state in her youth in her state especially as she's moved to now to a foreign country as well she's had to move back with Naomi to a land that she has not belonged to to a system to gods that she doesn't know is not familiar with she's made this commitment to stay with Naomi but that choice results in a different kind of insecurity a relational insecurity a providential insecurity another question of who's going to accept me i'm a foreigner i've been widowed I, who's going to love me there is another question that comes through here again we are sometimes distracted by boaz's kindness his faithfulness his gentleness but what is going on in ruth's mind through all this one more so boaz goes through the right process he does things properly he goes to the city gates where all the elders are gathered and he declares you guardian redeemer will you do the duty of fulfilling our family's legacy providing uh providing for Naomi and Ruth and everything that needs to happen there he says no i won't do it and so boaz says okay very well then i will then take the opportunity to marry Ruth and provide uh sons for our fallen brother and so he does all this and this is what happens afterwards chapter 4 verses 13 13 through 17 so boaz took ruth and she became his wife when he made love to her the lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son the woman said to naomi praise be to the lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer may he become famous throughout israel he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth then naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him the woman living there said naomi has a son and they named him obed he was the father of jesse the father of david that last line if you're someone of jewish descent is an important line because everyone in the jewish community knows that david eventually becomes the king over israel and so what the author is doing is he's pointing us that the legacy of boaz is one where through his faithfulness it results in his lineage becoming this line of kings that God establishes in the land fantastic but what is going through boaz's mind as he's taking on this endeavor what is going on in boaz's mind as he chooses to do this as as boaz himself is considering this move what's going on between him and god Boaz from the story we can tell is actually quite aged himself. He does not have his own family. He's an older gentleman. But he's also willing to let this first guardian redeemer take take the first opportunity. So he does things properly as well. This is a man of noble character. But in his older age, he must be wondering, will I be able to bear sons? Will God bless this union? Will my honor amongst my people be secure? How am I going to get through? this will i be accepted by my community as i take this on and what we see is god says yes when you read back through uh can you go back to the uh verse third oh, sorry i got i got when you read back through it the author is also incredibly explicit second verse second sentence there uh when he made love to her, the lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son we're being told very 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 specifically that god is the one who returns the kindness of boaz god is the one who blesses the union and enables not just boaz to have his legacy and his honor secured but also naomi sorry for ruth to then have a family to look after and uh, by because of that for naomi by the end of it to also be blessed as well 
The multifaceted, multipersonal insecurity of will I be loved, will I be accepted, will I be provided for, God, in his action, ultimately provides for all this. In the end, what we're told is that that results in the line of kings, King David and so on, coming through. But of course, for us as Christians on this side of history, we also know that the end result of that line of kings is that Israel is not saved. God, in this kindness, is preparing for the future where his own son, Jesus, has to die in order to make all this kindness an ultimate reality. That's the big meta-narrative that's going on here. This tension between acceptance or a lack of it, the insecurity that comes through, and what does it mean to show kindness? What does it mean to receive and accept kindness in that kind of way? Naomi asks, will anyone look after me in my old age? Ruth asks, will I be loved by anyone even though I'm a widow? Boaz asks, will my honor be secure? When we think about it, when we put our eyes, when we put ourselves into their shoes, we feel these exact tensions in our lives today as well. We could spend forever trying to learn what does it mean to, 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 to show this kind of faithfulness? What does it mean to show this kind of love? But maybe what will be useful for us is to spend a moment seeing what happens when we ask ourselves these kind of questions. Will I be loved? Will I be provided for? Will anyone accept me? We do this all the time. In very much the same way that I think maybe even Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz are trying to do as well, we, we work very hard to try to earn our acceptance. In our workplaces, in our families, in our friendships, we do everything that we can, whether consciously or subconsciously, to try to earn the acceptance of those around us. By the way we dress, by the way we talk, by the food we eat, in our, in the majority of people in the majority of people in this room, we, we come from an Asian background. The, the the desire, the pressure to honor our parents through getting into the good university, through getting into a good job, through getting married at an early age and having kids, the the the, the chronology of that, the pressure to do those kind of things in our in our workplaces, how hard we have to try to qualify, how hard we have to try to get promoted, how hard we have to try to get to get acknowledged, seen as someone valuable and an asset to our organizations. We work very hard at that. In our relationships, we try very hard at that as well, don't we? The way we talk, the way we present ourselves, how we showered that morning, those kind of things, all point to this idea that actually what drives us on the inside, as well as our, as well as our idea to connect, to have that neutrality, is this deep-seated, perhaps sometimes insecurity of asking ourselves the question, how do I earn my acceptance by you? But we need to be accepted for our welfare, for our emotional needs, and for our place in society. It is the very, very questions that Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz ask of themselves. These are legitimate needs. We need to be accepted. This is not something that's bad. Trying to earn our acceptance is actually a completely normal part of our process. Whether it comes out of a place of insecurity or whether it comes out of a place of confidence, we still need relationships. We need to be part of something, not just to stand on ourselves. About 15 years ago, I think it was, um, I went on a, uh, it was a stag do, not a typical stag do. No one got, no, no, I didn't get drunk anyway. I think some of the others might have. Um, I went on a stag do. Uh, it was a guy called Ben who was getting married. Uh, he had uh, a lot of friends. There were about 20 of us at a villa in Malta. So this was a pretty expensive and adventurous thing as well. So we're on, this, we're on this island of Malta. I think we were somewhere along the, the south coast of it. Um, and on the second day of our three-day um, stay over there, um, we decided to, to rent scooters to, to just like drive and cruise around the island. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, only about half of us decided to, to, to do this. The other half stayed on the minibus and were kind of like this support vehicle driving behind this, this, this gang of Asian kids on scooters in, in Malta. It looked very, very weird. I was one of the 10 that foolishly decided to get on one of these scooters as well. And, and I thought um, that I was going to be able to handle it. I'd, I'd ridden a scooter before, a couple of years prior to that, uh, out, out in Canada. For a, it was only a gang of three uh, at that point. 
Um, but on this occasion, what I didn't realize is that the scooters that we were renting were substantially more powerful than the ones that I had rented before. Uh, and so the guy who was renting these scooters to us, um, he kind of like just he gave us one each, and he asked, "Okay, are you guys all comfortable with riding these things?" And then we said, "Yeah, yeah we're okay. We're very comfortable riding these things." Um, and I, yeah, I'm also very comfortable with it. When I, when, when I heard the engines, I knew I might have made a mistake here. And so he watched each of us have a go on our scooters to see how we would fare, just to make sure we we're going to be safe, we we're going to be okay. And so one by one, we all got on our scooters went up and then came back down, and as long as he saw we could keep balance and we could steer, fantastic. When it got to my turn, I sheepishly got on the scooter, turned the accelerator, and immediately vid left into a wall. <laughs> it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Not because I'd crashed, but because I'd crashed in front of all of my friends but because I crashed in front of people that I hadn't even gotten to know yet, in front of these 20 guys, most of them who were older than me, that I respected, that I really admired, that I wanted to look cool in front of. And the first thing I do when I get on a scooter is I embarrass myself. In that moment, I just wanted to die and shrink away. I did not feel accepted. I did not feel cool. I felt like I had suddenly ex exiled myself from this group of brothers and gentlemen that I was trying to impress, ultimately. We work so hard to try to, be, to try to look cool. We work so hard to try to impress others. We work so hard to want to be accepted. And when we feel that rejection, no matter the context of it, no matter whether it was a mistake or some minor error, the effects on our person can sometimes be forgotten. Now, thankfully, these were Christian brothers. They, they were there. Okay. In fact, someone else had a really bad accident during that trip. So it took all the focus away from me uh, after my little thing in the morning. Um, but that's the thing. We want to be accepted. We try very hard, despite our weaknesses, to be accepted. In fact, it's because we're so aware of our flaws. It's so, because we're so aware of the things that we're not good at, of the times when we look at the scooter and we realize, I'm not sure I can do this. And it's in those moments that we, that we then are so profoundly aware of our need for acceptance. Not that we want to impress, but we want at that moment to be accepted despite our weaknesses. We want to be accepted in ignorance of our weaknesses. And so on one level, On one level, acceptance is conditional. In many ways, our desire or our choice to accept someone or someone's choice to accept us is conditional. Are you part of us? Do you speak the same language? Do you eat the same food? Do you believe in the right things? Do you follow the same political party? Do you look like us? Do you have the same attributes as me and as us so that we can accept you? Acceptance is on one level conditional. And the reason why we hold that condition is because when we choose to accept someone or when we want to be accepted, it, it gives access to resources. When we choose to accept someone, what we're really doing is we're saying, okay, I will let you access my time, my energy, my resources, my attention. That is the cost of acceptance. And so therefore, we put a condition on that acceptance. But when it comes down to it, I know that deep inside of myself that I need people to accept me despite my weaknesses, to have access to their time, attention, and energy, even though I don't actually fully deserve it. And what I've learned is that in my closest friendships, that is the nature of the acceptance. On that stag do, that acceptance was very conditional. We each had to prove ourselves to be initiated into the pack. But in my closest friendships, what I've realized is that acceptance is not conditional. It's actually born out of a completely different motivation and a completely different angle. Last week, if you were here, um, we had the, the pleasure and honor of having um, uh, Pastor James Tang um, come here to preach to us. I'm sure most of you remember that he was, he was here, preached a really good sermon on faithfulness. And... Me, me and James, uh, he mentioned it last week already. Me and James, we've been friends for the last, how long has it been now? 
I would call it 10, 12 years um, at this point. Uh, like he said, um, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to be the godfather of his children, uh, both out of honor for the relationship, but also just the, 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 the sheer closeness that me and him, him have in this. Uh, me and James, we've been working, well, we were, before he moved out to Hong Kong, we were working together um, in the BBC Church kind of network, running conferences together, serving, serving the people around us together, thinking about all the, all the dreams and desires that God was placing on the side, inside of our hearts for the British Chinese Church in all of its facets. And we were working so hard together. We prayed so much together, working hard together in the field. And I found such brotherhood, such faithfulness, such support and encouragement in him. To the point where most, most people inside of our, our network know that there's a very, very close relationship between, between me and him. They know that when me and James show up, we're going to be spending so much time just encouraging each other, working with one, with one another. We, we've, we've been able to present that a, as a model of what it looks like to have close brotherhood amongst one another as we serve. And we hope that that's been a model that encourages other people to seek the same kind of thing in their own faith and their own church life as well. What most people don't see, though, is that me and James are incredibly different people. Incredibly different people. Even the person you see of me right now up on stage, it is, it is one facet, it is one, I wouldn't say facade, but it is one persona that I'm using to present who I am right now, to present this story, to present this sermon. At home, I'm quiet. A lot of people, when they first see me, they think, or see me in this kind of context, they think, oh, Josh must be a really, really extroverted, people kind of person. I'm not. I spend most of Monday to Saturday at home talking to, not even talking to myself, just in my own thoughts, reading my books. I'm a really strong int introvert. James is the complete opposite. He loves meeting people. He loves talking to people, getting to know their story. I, I, I talk with my books. I, I, I meet people through these one-on-one -on -one conversations, whereas James is talk, can talk to a whole room of people and get, to feel, get a feel of the room. I play badminton. James is really good at basketball. He likes invasion sports. I like to make sure there's a net between me and my opponents. <laughs> James is a fantastic pastor that I really admire. I prefer the teaching, the intellectual therapy that goes on here. When me and James talk about work, when me and James are engaged in our united ministry, it's fantastic. We are partners in crime. We are brothers. In, we are co-soldiers on the battlefield together. Once me and James run out of things to talk about, in ministry terms, after a couple of hours, we get bored of each other. <laughs> and that's not completely true. I'm trying to, to paint a picture of it here. Me and James are very different. Our personalities, our temperaments, our uh, interests are different to each other. James has seen me in my most vulnerable times. James has seen me in my most weakest times. I've seen him in his times of doubt and of wrestling. When he first moved out to Hong Kong, there were a million questions as to whether this was what the Lord was leading him to do. And we would just sit there on the phone. We were in Hong Kong. We would just sit there and we would just think and we would just pray and we would just listen. I've seen him in his most vulnerable times. He's seen me in my most weakest and vulnerable times as well. What allows us to accept and love and care for each other in those times of weakness and vulnerability? It's not just because we enjoy those good times together, but I think it's something about, and this is my testimony, I think it's something about how it is the love of God that actually unites us. That sounds very cliche, but I think it is the profundity of that very, very thing that makes our acceptance of one another so real. We could keep our friendship and our partnership conditional, but there is something about how God has brought us together in ministry, in our desire to, to want to honor and love God through our energies, through our relationship as brothers to one another. That becomes the thing that allows us to accept each other despite those times when we've seen the worst and the most vulnerable and the weakest sides of each other. And when we think about that, what we suddenly realize is that acceptance at that point isn't so much something that you can earn from someone else. Acceptance in its ultimate form isn't something that we earn. Acceptance in its ultimate form is something, it's a gift 
that we can give to others. Acceptance is a gift that we must be ready to give to others, and acceptance is something that we must be ready to receive from others as well. Earned acceptance is conditional, but gifted acceptance becomes unconditional. Gifted acceptance becomes unconditional. What do I mean by that? In Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 9, it says this. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, excuse me, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. What Paul is trying to say here is that you Jews and you Gentiles, whereas you are so different to each other, whereas there are so many things about your cultures, about your language, about your philosophy, that would otherwise bring you into conflict, Christ is the one who through his life brings peace between you and him and therefore enables you to find peace between each other as well enables you to accept one another. It is the people who are the most different to us, who threaten our existence, who have a demand on our time, energy, and resources. Those are the ones that sometimes we have the greatest conditions against before we accept them. And what Paul is trying to tell us is that, no, no, no. Christ has already accepted you in ways that we could never fulfill those conditions. And so if he is in you, if his condition is if, if he no longer conditionally needs, has anything on you, you now no longer need to maintain any conditions on your acceptance of others as well. And the reason for that, what Paul is saying, is because Christ has already fulfilled, let me put this, what stops us from being accepted by God? What stops us from accepting others? If acceptance is on one level conditional, well, who, who then fulfills those conditions? What allows us to be able to give and receive acceptance unconditionally? What Paul says is because Christ has already fulfilled the conditions of that acceptance. It is not to arbitrarily say that con- acceptance is no longer conditional and we can just freely give it. That doesn't make complete sense. But what if the idea is that on the cross, Jesus already fulfilled every condition, not even on the cross actually, in his life, Jesus fulfilled every condition of kindness, of goodness, of holiness, and because Christ himself has fulfilled every condition, when he then dies on the cross, and when we then allow our lives to be placed in him on that cross, that means that somehow we can take Jesus' life, and somehow we have then fulfilled the conditions of God's acceptance of us. Let me say that once more. Because Christ fulfilled all the conditions required of God's acceptance of us, we now can be accepted by God unconditionally. That's what makes acceptance in Christ's world ultimately a gift that we can receive and therefore can give to others as well. When we hold into this first state that acceptance is purely conditional, we get stuck We spend our entire lives trying to earn the acceptance of others. But the moment that we realize that if Christ is in us, that he has already fulfilled every condition required for my acceptance by God and my acceptance of others, that suddenly changes our entire approach to what it means to be a spiritual family. Perhaps what was going on in those three scenes in the book of Ruth was that the Holy Spirit was giving these three people the generosity, the love, and the faithfulness of Christ himself in order to then have the grace to accept others. 
the grace that Ruth gives to Naomi, the grace that Boaz gives to, gives to Ruth, the grace that God ultimately gives to the entire family is something that ultimately points to the grace that Christ offers us today by his death and his success. And the moment we realize, the moment that you realize that your life is completely secure, welcomed, and accepted by God, and there's nothing that you can do to lose it, there is nothing that you can do to earn it, there is nothing that you can do to not be given the gift of God's acceptance, if you choose to accept it, that changes your posture towards those around you. It allows you to realize that even if I give you access to my time, my energy, my resources, because I already have access to the time, energy, and resources of God in heaven, even if it's going to cost me something, it will never cost me everything. Even if this hurts, it will never destroy me. Even if welcoming you, even though you might be someone that's junior to me, someone that is going to be a drain on me, it will never be something that will ultimately hurt me because I am safe, secure, welcomed, and accepted by the love of God in Christ. It allows us against the spirit of our age which says, you do you. Do you. Yeah, you're, you're wonderful. You're, you're, you're great. You go do whatever you want. Find, find yourself. That sounds like acceptance, but really what it is, it's a desire to keep you, different, keep you distant from me. It's a desire says, yes, you go find yourself. You arrive somewhere. You find what your destiny is, your calling is. But what if true acceptance is to say, your God will be my God. Where you go, I will go. There is a difference between what biblical acceptance looks like and what this world's apparent acceptance of us actually looks like. And so I'll finish around here. Oh, I've done that already. Where in your life, where in our lives are we still trying to earn acceptance? I'll say that again. Where are you still trying to earn acceptance? Are there areas in your life, relationships in your life, circles in your life, where you're still working every day to ride that scooter properly? Where in your life are there still areas where the insecurity is still there? In your old age, in your ability, in your learning, in, in your friendships, in your family? Where are there still areas in your life where you're still trying to earn that acceptance? You've not felt it yet. And what does it mean for you to encounter God's grace, his acceptance in Jesus, to allow the Holy Spirit, in the same way the Holy Spirit was working in these three people here in this story, as the Holy Spirit draws into your life, into your context, to find that you are already accepted by God because the conditions of that acceptance have already been fulfilled by Jesus himself. Because if that's the reality, that then gives you the strength to be able to accept others around you into this family of God as well, into this spiritual family. You're, not, you're never going to have to operate on your own in that. As we remember, as we realize that we are not just operating as Christians individually, but we operate as a church family, welcoming others not just into my life and access to my personal resources, but access into this room of resources, this wider spiritual family and all of the strength that that creates not because we've worked for it because God himself is cultivating this family into his kingdom part of something greater so when we as a spiritual family realize that our acceptance by God has already been won by Jesus what does that do to our posture and our ability and our confidence to welcome others into this as well. And so that starts with this first question, where in our lives are we still trying to earn acceptance? What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to come into that space and says, don't worry, you don't have to earn it from those people. I already accept you. Your heavenly Father already accepts you. And if that's true, how does that shape what we do and look like today? Next week is going to be an Oikos service. A time when we just get to gather as a family. We get to practice what it means to eat cake together. We get 
time to practice what does it mean for us intergenerationally to ask questions, to find wisdom from those around us, above us, near us? What does it mean for us to act as a family in blessing other families outside, to demonstrate what it looks like when this family rallies together to show that kind of acceptance and love for those outside of, us, outside of this family as well? As the Spirit works in that space, might that be a time for us to welcome and accept others into this. And so for the rest of this week, as we look forward to next week and all the weeks after that, in our everyday, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever it is, what, it might, what does it look like for us to realize for ourselves in the first place that we're already accepted, you're already loved, you're already welcomed into the family of God? And how is that going to shape how we see those that God has placed around us as well. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this story of Ruth, and not just in the way that it inspires us to accept others, Lord God, but we thank you for the way that it shows us deeply how much we are already loved and accepted by you. We pray that as we learn what it means to be a spiritual family, may your spirit be the one that speaks that acceptance into our heart first. And as we realize that, as we find our confidence and our grounding, our very identity in your love, because Jesus has already fulfilled every condition of our acceptance, may that then supply us with every confidence, every peace, and every courage, every encouragement and endurance that we need to then love those you're placing around us, Lord God. So help us in this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come to a time of communion now. I invite you, if you've been baptized, uh, to come and take communion with us. If you haven't picked up one of these on the way in, uh, the stewards, just raise your hand and the stewards will come and bring it by. Communion is a time for us to reflect and remember what God's done for us. Uh, it's by his death on the cross that we are actually accepted into his family. And the powerful picture of Jesus spreading out his arms on the cross is almost an expression of his willingness uh, to then later embrace us and bring us into his family. It's that same embrace that we take and say, actually, God, as your children, we want to welcome more people into your presence and your family. So let's just be still before the Lord before we come to communion. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because your sacrifice on the cross means that we have been forgiven from our sins. But, Lord, we know that that cost was great, Lord. And so let's not take for granted what you've done for us, Lord. And so we confess our sins to you, our unholiness, our racism, our pride, our insecurities, Lord. We lay them all at the foot of your cross, Lord. And say that you have called us into being your family of love. So let your spirit transform us. And as you wash us clean from our sins and wrongdoing, let us be revived by your spirit. We thank you in your name, we pray. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. I advise now to open up the top layer and we'll take the bread together. Shall we take the bread together? After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a symbol of the new covenant. Take and drink in a remembrance of me. Let's open up the cup and we'll drink it together. Take a symbol. As the worship team comes up and leads us into a time of worship, uh, let's use this time to really come before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. We thank you that now, in your presence, Lord, your spirit brings us to life. So let us put down our insecurities and know the acceptance and warmth of you. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's come and worship. Shall we all stand? Father Lord, we we were in the pit of sin that we have no hope of getting out of, but Jesus, your death on the cross has redeemed us, Lord. We come with a grateful heart and just praise you for your amazing love. Hallelujah.
Father Lord, we, as we come to the close um, of this um, service, we ask you, Lord, to bless your people here, Lord. Just release your blessing as they go through their week. As a family, we go out, Lord, to proclaim your kingdom in our family, in our workplace. May your name be glorified, Lord. In all that we do, we honor you because you are our hope. You are our life. is our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our soul to Him belong who holds our days within His hands who comes apart from His command what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing So, but God is good, God is good, and where's His grace and goodness know? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who stands away. To the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing. Oh, sing.
Christ he lives, Christ he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, then we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will is ours forevermore. Let's do very So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thanks for joining us. See you guys next week. Bring cake. And, uh...